All right, welcome everyone for the panel session number four of the Global Game Changer Summit with an amazing topic. I think our MCs have amazingly introduced the topic and you guys also see in the video, we have this topic called Young Voices uh, in changing, you know, you know, in global issues, in, you know, in changing the world, in addressing the, pro in the, uh, addressing the problems that save, like faced by the world. And I ever since I got to know that this panel exists, I was really excited. Um, just because I'm someone who truly believe that the youngsters have the solutions to the world problems and they have incredible ideas which uh, can potentially one day with the enough resources, guidance and support can solve the world problems that we are facing right now. And, you know, and many of them just lack the, the, the three things that I just mentioned, support, resources and guidance. So to advocate that, I actually run a non-profit organization uh, called PMDK in uh, Malaysia, where we actually go to schools every day, like, you know, go to different, different kind of schools in rural area or in urban areas to uh, preach them about this, to tell them that, you know, you can become a global game changer. You can, uh, you know, solve world problems someday. All you have to do is trust your idea, work on your idea and uh, start taking action on your idea. And we actually connect them with the global game changers, global young change makers uh, that, that, you know, at currently who are solving world problems. And I'm so honored and happy that uh, I'm moderating this particular panel with three amazing speakers who are in a way solving world problems in whatever they are doing. They are someone who have, who are young, who had an amazing idea and they just don't like, you know, have an idea. They worked on that idea they uh with the limited resources they have they try to find the resources the guidance the support everything that they need to implement this idea and right now with with these ideas into like you know they put into practice they have organizations where like, where they're impacting thousands of people and solving a lot of world problems through whatever that they do so without any further ado let's welcome the three amazing speakers to the virtual screen All right, hello, Mei Huan, Jason, and Rebecca. How are you guys doing today? Hey, everyone. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, Jason. Hello. <laughs> hello. Uh, first of all, guys, thank you so much for joining this panel session at the Godly Hour. I know what time it is at wherever you guys are right now. So um, thank you so much for picking the time to come and share your experience here. So um, let's jump right into the session because we have a lot of things to ask, a little lot of things to share. And I think our audience are also very active today. They keep asking questions to all the panelists. So get ready to answer a few of the impromptu questions from them as well. So uh, to start it off, um, I want you guys to introduce yourself. Please do uh, introduce yourself. What are the things that you guys are doing right now, your projects? And also one interesting fact about you that nobody knows. Or they couldn't find it anywhere if they even searched about you. So just um, tell us about it. Who wants to start first? Okay, let, let me pick. Okay, Jason, let's go. You're already <laughs> you're already there. Let's go. Fantastic. Yeah, so uh, my name is Jason Plant. I recently graduated from the University of New Hampshire with a degree in entrepreneurship, uh, which is exactly what I decided to do once I graduated. Um, so I actually run three companies today. The first is Hydrofoss Solutions, which I founded during my sophomore year of college. Um, that's a circular economy company that focuses on wastewater treatment and uh, nutrient reclamation. Um, upon my graduation, I got recruited to be the president of Tory Project, which is an organization not dissimilar from Ascendance, actually. Uh, that's dedicated to teaching entrepreneurs and training the next generation of stakeholder focused entrepreneurs. And I recently founded also a company called Green Lightning Energy that's dedicated to providing affordable clean energy to the New England region where I'm from. Um, and a, a fun fact, this is my favorite thing about me is that a few months ago, I actually had the privilege of traveling to Tanzania which is just an absolutely beautiful country. Uh, I got the opportunity to take a safari in the Serengeti and see the great migration of the wildebeest and the zebras um, and do some really rewarding economic development work as well. So um, that's one thing that, 
that I'll share on that. Thank you so much. I think uh, thank you so much for participating. What's next? Are you ready? Sorry, I did you say me? I can't hear you. <laughs> Can you hear me now, Rebecca? Yeah. Yeah, I have to go. Um yeah, also Jason, very impressed by your three businesses. That's um you must be very, very, very busy. Um so yeah, hi, I'm Rebecca and I'm a marine biologist and a science communicator and I'm the director of the Marine Diaries. Um, I'm also an ambassador for Sheba Hope Grows, which is a kind of global effort to restore coral reefs. Um, and a fun fact about me is that I learned to scuba dive when I was about nine years old. Um, so started pretty young um, and definitely have kind of continued uh, in the ocean sphere. Um, but yeah, so the Marine Diaries is a marine conservation nonprofit um, and we use storytelling and digital media to try and communicate ocean science and increase ocean literacy in general. Um, and we've got to focus on kind of ocean education and deliver this through like a variety of different um, kind of avenues. So we do a lot of collaborative awareness projects with other organizations and individuals. Uh, a couple of examples are Plastic Not Fantastic, which was a campaign we did on plastic, uh, plastic pollution. And then Marine Ecosystem Diaries, which was a nine month project um, creating educational materials on nine different marine ecosystems, which are really important globally. And we also have um, article series, events, ocean expeditions, films, um, and something that's quite important uh, personally is we also provide um, career development for early career ocean advocates. So through kind of volunteer opportunities, we have a series called Into the Industry, and we also do kind of careers workshops, and we have internship programs as well to help people develop their skills. And that's me. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. I think you already have a lot of fans, uh, like, you know, waiting for you, like they were saying uh, hi to you, and also some of them saying that their dream is to become a marine biologist. And I think meeting you here today is a big dream come true. And uh, whoever that is commented that, please do ask a lot of questions. And if we have the time, I will definitely ask Rebecca the particular question. Okay, so let's move on to Mei Huan. Yeah, hi everyone. So my name is Meg Juan and I'm a high school student based in um, Toronto, Canada. And there's two big projects that I'm currently involved in. So the first, um, I'm the founder of the Canadian Young Investor Society. We're a federally registered not-for-profit um, that's completely youth-led. And we focus on spreading financial literacy to especially the remote um, and underprivileged communities across Canada. So again, we host like webinars, workshops, and competitions that cover things all the way from like personal finance to um, what we're actually doing today, which is like a college admissions workshop um, for like young high school students where you get like admission officers to come and speak about their experience. So it's definitely been a project that I'm very passionate about. I spearheaded this around a year ago and we got to work with so much amazing like corporate partners and um, different influencers, so, like social media personalities. It's definitely been um, quite a journey. And I, the other project I wanted to speak about was Coast. Um, so it's an invention that I did a few years ago and it basically turns like your um, sh like optical mouse into like a shoe pad. So then people with upper limb disabilities can access computer technologies. And um, it, it's also a huge advocator for just um, disabled accessibility and disability rights. Um, a fun fact, I feel like because Rebecca mentioned scuba diving, I can do that as well. I actually learned how to scuba dive when I was 12 and um, I still hold a license. I'm looking forward to like going scuba diving again. It's definitely been a while, but it's one of the things I really enjoy doing. We should go together. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say that. I was about to, <laughs> I was about to say that. I don't know about I, I don't know, but you all three of you guys are very adventurous uh in what you guys do in your free time, like scuba diving, going to a different country and see the you know the great migration. Wow. 
if you ask me one interesting fact about myself, I will just say I can talk a lot. So, <laughs> so uh, thank you so much, guys. And uh, again, I have a lot of questions to ask you guys. But uh, let's start from um, the beginning. Like, um, it's not like one day you wake up, then you suddenly have this great idea that you want to work on, you want to invest in this project, your entire time, your energy and everything, right? There's something happened that um, inspired you or maybe someone inspired you to start this project, to work on this idea. So maybe you can share with you guys, share with us, like, how did you got that idea and how did you guys start the, take the first step to work on it? Because I think there are many uh, youngsters are watching this session right now and I do believe that they have great ideas in their head right now but they just don't know how to take the first step towards it. So you guys telling uh, how you get the idea, what inspired you to start on this project and how you guys take the first step will be a great uh, opportunity for them to listen to you guys. From. So who want to go first now? Am I going first? <laughs> okay, let's go, Rebecca. Um, so yeah, I think for me, there's not necessarily been like one moment. Um, I've always, from a really young age, been like really fascinated with nature and the environment um, and science in general and just kind of loving being outdoors and learning about how you know biology works and um, just find all of that kind of stuff fascinating um, both my parents have you know got a big love of the outdoors as well and my mum was uh, like a very technical diver scuba diver so I think from a young age, we were kind of exposed to, you know, David Attenborough documentaries, going to aquariums, going to museums, the classic, which I think is a lot of people. Um, and yeah, so I always kind of knew that I wanted to kind of go into marine biology or something scientific. Um, but the marine diaries kind of started uh, when I was doing my master's in tropical marine biology uh, with a couple of my course mates at the time and we kind of realized that we were in this bubble this science bubble um having you know done scientific degrees and being in that space and basically realizing that the that kind of science and the scientific research just wasn't getting to the general public um so there was this you might have heard of it like the blue planet 2 effect um in regards to plastic pollution and basically we kind of learned about in one of our lectures how you know the scientific community had had known about plastic pollution in the ocean for the last 50 years um but the general public just weren't aware of it at all and then blue planet 2 happened and there was that scene at the end you know with the the plastic um and that was like one key message in this amazing amazing kind of storytelling natural history documentary um and that uh, you know, series actually kickstarted like a global movement um, of single use plastic bans, um, people calling out retailers, and just this amazing increased understanding of how plastic impacts wildlife. Um, so we really saw that impact and then just kind of wanted to use that storytelling and that digital media approach for all of the other issues that are also affecting the ocean. Um, and really kind of have that element of like connecting people to the ocean and with the issue um, from wherever they, they might be. Um, so yeah, that's kind of how it started, I guess. And then from there, it's kind of grown into an organization. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, Erica, for for sharing that. I mean, for, for you, it's always been that the, it's not like one specific incident or like one... Uh, one scenario is just that is continuous exposing to to that particular thing to the oceans and your love towards the ocean keep on increasing every single day and one day yeah. you decided you know what stop polluting this ocean that i love and i'm going to uh, go on the ground and or maybe i will say go on the ocean and start working uh, you know for a solutions to solve all these problems that's great thank you so much uh, rebecca so who want to go next i'm happy to go uh, yeah, for me, I kind of knew from a pretty early age that I was interested in making an impact, but it took me a while to figure out exactly what my medium of the impact would be. Um, <clears throat> I think for me, it began when I was in high school and I was taking an entrepreneurship course and I thought it was really cool and really interesting, but what really got my attention 
was the module on social entrepreneurship. And to me, learning about this, it just seemed like the ultimate win-win situation because you're able to make an impact while making a profit and you can use that profit to scale that impact. And for me, um, that was a really cool vehicle for impact. And so um, I ended up diving into that. But for a while, um, while I was very interested in social entrepreneurship, I did not have a good idea. I wasn't like Mei Juan where I had a great idea in high school uh, and decided to start it. But um, in my senior year of high school, I did um, get a glimmer of hope that I might be able to chase that dream. And that began for me in an ecology class, which was one of the few classes that I took outside of the business school. I do recommend taking more gen eds. Wish I took more <laughs> when I was in college. But uh, when I was in this ecology class, I got the opportunity to learn about this phenomenon called eutrophication. And that's essentially when too many nutrients are expelled into bodies of water and they cause what are called harmful algal blooms. So these dense, green, sludgy, uh, big, big blooms of algae that basically destroy an entire aquatic ecosystem, whether it's a lake, a river, um, it also happens in the oceans as well. And so for me, um, around the same time, I was challenging myself to compete in my school's social venture entrepreneurship competition. Um, and I was putting together a team and thinking about this problem of eutrophication and what could be done about it. And what I noticed about other teams that had succeeded in this competition was they, many of them used this business model called the circular economy business model, where you turn a waste product into a profit stream by recycling it. And it basically allows you to just continuously recycle something that was not previously recyclable before. Um, and so when we were doing some research on the issue of eutrophication, we found that one of the biggest drivers of eutrophication was phosphorus and specifically phosphorus that was discharged from municipal wastewater treatment plants. Um, and we found that on the other end, if you wanna recycle phosphorus, there's actually a global phosphorus shortage in the fertilizer market. And phosphorus is just this critical, irreplaceable resource. Everybody takes it for granted. Not a lot of people think about it or, or know about it, but you absolutely need it to grow food and we don't have enough of it because it's kind of like the oil industry. Uh, phosphorus, we get all of it from mines. And so we found a great opportunity in that we were able to take phosphorus out of the wastewater streams and redirect that into the fertilizer industry where there wasn't enough phosphorus and there was a deep need for sustainably sourced phosphorus. And uh, to my great surprise, we were not only successful in that first competition, uh, but we were welcomed by this large ecosystem at UNH and even more broadly than that. And so my big takeaway from um, starting that and thinking about starting new ventures as well is just to not be, not be afraid because it can often feel like you're in a vacuum and you have to figure it all out yourself. Uh, but that it could not be further from the truth. There's a whole ecosystem of people out there to help you, help make you successful, to mentor you, um, and to even give you funding. And Ascendance is a great example of the kind of resources that exist out there uh, for you to just make it happen. Um, and today, my biggest inspiration to keep going uh, is my mentors who have already accomplished a lot of great things ahead of me and made a significant impact. And so getting to learn from them is, is what keeps me going for sure. All right. Awesome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jason. One thing I liked about what you uh, shared was that there, there are a few steps that you uh, like, you know, figure it out along the way. Like, it's not like you have a perfect business plan or a perfect plan. You just deep down, you know that you're going to do something that impacts people's life eventually. But then uh, when you keep thinking about it, like, you know, keep having that thought in the back of your head, the, the scenario just started to present by itself. Or maybe you start looking for it, like, you know, when you first exposed to social entrepreneurship, 
entrepreneurship that's like the wow this is great that's what i want to do and then suddenly you got the next idea you got the next idea you got the next idea and then you keep on moving and finding the right people and resources which was great thank you so much uh, jason for sharing that okay make one yeah for sure um i think that my journey into both my projects were also kind of um what jason and rebecca talked about which is like the high school courses um so i took a lot of like business and entrepreneurship courses as well in high school but before that um i was always very interested in financial literacy um like as a kid i remember um like doing like these small side businesses in like middle school um so i always like was like actively looking for like a way where i can like channel my passion for like just entrepreneurship and then after taking those courses i started getting more into like personal finance and also um learned about things like investing and stocks and things like that very like basic um like concepts and i was empowered when i was like getting ready to go into post secondary um and i looked around in like my community and a lot of the students had a similar experience where we actually didn't know anything about saving or what happens when you move out um and it was like a really real experience for a lot of youth in canada because although we do have like entrepreneurship classes and financial literacy classes it doesn't cover a lot in depth and it doesn't provide a lot of practical skills um, that's applicable to when you actually move out and when you start your own life. So me and a couple of friends decided to get together and come up with like a grassroots like startup nonprofit idea where we educate youth on financial literacy. But something that we wanted to do differently from the other organizations was really highlight on the accessibility part. Um, I think a lot of people think that if you want to join a, I would say like a business organization, you would have to have a lot of prior knowledge and experience, which obviously a lot of high school students don't have. So we wanted it to be like an open space where anyone can take part in what we do and also grow um, with us as an organization. So that's for uh, my nonprofit. As for my other invention, which I think I want to touch upon because it's so different from the work I do with CYS. Um, it started again in high school when I was in 10th grade. So when I was in fifth, when I was like 15, I did a research project for like a history class where I was focusing on the effects of um, the Syrian like civil war and the conflict. And I bumped like across a research article about the swim instructor who was teaching kids with like um, like limb disabilities how to swim and they use that to cope with like a lot of the trauma from the war and then um, I was really like inspired and also curious about how people can like adapt especially um, like disability access and I got really um, into that cause and that movement. And then at the same time, I was doing a fellowship at the University of Waterloo, which is a pretty um, influential like science and mathematics university in um, Canada. And one of my professors, I was like talking with them about it. And then I was like, oh, this is just something I found really interesting. And then they encouraged me to actually like take action and um, come up with a solution. Um, even like a small, tiny step towards um, bettering like this cause. So that's what I did. And I remember like doing like, hand-drawn like drafts and prototypes. And um, I spent like almost two years cultivating this project. And I got so much support from like different faculty and different like organizations that I was a part of. So it's a huge effort from a lot of my mentors as well. But yeah, the final product, it's still in um, development phase. Like I'm looking to develop like a finalized version and I'm also pitching it to a lot of like different charities and prosthetic companies. And that's where uh, my project is right now. So it's definitely come a long way, um, like both CYS and Coast and something I want to expand in the future as well. Awesome, awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Mehwan, for sharing your perspective of how like what inspired you to start your organization your nonprofit organization and what keeps you going and i like the 
uh, part where you you keep on mentioning where like you know you got just a little bit of hunch like an idea or a thought like maybe these people should know about this right and then you just didn't stop there even though you like don't have much resources or you don't know anyone in that field or uh, like no knowledge in that field you you somehow find the right people uh, you know in that field to guide you in a way or give you a, a direction like where to go left right center so that you know where to head towards that and i think that's uh, brings to my next question right so um i i like i i also work with a lot of youngsters in the field here in the ground and stuff like that and i think one important problems that they all face is even though they have a great idea like you know some of them even have their prototypes the invention and stuff like that right after that moving forward to the next step they don't know how to take and they lack the resources the guidance the support um to actually bring this forward like uh, jason may jason mentioned that you actually met uh, like a amazing mentors who are actually guide you that like you know guided you in moving forward and stuff like that and all um, like mehwan and David, rebecca also mentioned that you guys met the right type of people and then uh, they helped you to move forward or somehow point the way and it's not like you just wait there for them to come and find you and then uh, tell you where to go and all right so you guys take the step you guys take the actions in finding the necessary could be in terms of information could be the knowledge uh, could be the resources the guidance the mentorship how did you guys uh, first started to get this kind of things for your ideas for your organizations to grow grow forward who want to go, go for next jason you ready jason sure yeah <laughs> um for us yeah like the biggest challenge that we faced um and had to overcome in order to start our our venture successfully was um uh, what i call chicken and egg problem right so you need to have a product in order to get funding for your venture but you need some amount of funding in order to create your product right understand uh, not, <laughs> very not nice every, energy yep <laughs> not not every venture has this when i started the solar company it was kind of like yeah you know the customer gives us money and then we go buy the panels right we don't need to have the panels up front but uh in this case with hydrofoss that was a really big problem for us and so luckily the way that we were founded we kind of stumbled into the solution to that problem uh, without really knowing it and that was look for ways that you can get funding without actually having a product and so for us uh, our medium for getting this funding was the entrepreneurship competitions that we did so originally um you know we we started with the sbic where we got like thirty five hundred dollars of funding which was a lot, but for the kind of infrastructural uh, projects that we were trying to do, we needed at least tens of thousands of dollars in funding, but probably more like hundreds of thousands. And so we were like, okay, this idea might be impossible for people like us that are not starting with any capital. Um, but eventually we realized that that entrepreneurship competition that we started with at our university was not the only one out there and we really enjoyed doing the competitions anyway so we figured we would try our luck at others and it just turned into this snowball where once you've succeeded in one it kind of helps you succeed in the others uh, both from the experience and from the materials you've built up but also the fact that you can say we won this other entrepreneurship competition and so one thing turned into another and we ended up collecting a lot of victories in the entrepreneurship competitions. Um, but just my takeaway from that experience is like um, seek ways that you can find funding without having a product. There's a lot of ways to do it. Entrepreneurship competitions worked really well for us, um, but there's also crowdfunding. There's also pre-sales. Uh, there's also grants and also just ask yourself, do you need funding? to start what you're doing because sometimes you actually don't uh, and and some people think they need to have a pile of money to start you don't always need that um, and so for us one of the biggest things too was just being okay with the path forward not being so clear because when we started it wasn't clear if we were going to get that funding but as long as you can keep working on it uh, keep taking in new advice and thinking outside the box on the problems that you're facing 
overcome. You can overcome any challenge and find a way forward. Awesome. Thank you so much. I think uh, not only youngsters who are watching, uh, you know, said the session need to hear what you just mentioned. I think everybody who have the passion towards starting their own organization or a business or start to work on a project, but you always think that funding might be a very big deal. You couldn't take the first step because of funding. I think Jason's answer was a very uh, good way to figure out. I really like the way you said that you actually need the funds. You know, so <laughs> many times you don't. That's, that's what I believe in. Also, so um, thank you so much, uh, Jason. It's a very good and a great explanation about the some of the problem that you face and how you guys find that solution. Very, very nice. Thank you so much, Rebecca. You want to go next? Sure thing. Um, and yeah, I think some of mine overlaps uh, with Jason's, and I'm sure my hand is the same as well. It's okay. um, oh, hey. <laughs> I think for for us, we're a completely voluntary organisation, and we have been for the last uh, five years. Um, so for us, really, like the main issue, I would say, uh, or challenge, is the capacity that we have. Um, we've got loads of ideas, if there's loads of things we want to do, um, but obviously everyone's time is limited. Um, most of us have full-time jobs as well, or our students. So it's really having to think about um, focusing on one thing at once, um, which we definitely haven't done um, <laughs> over the last couple of years, but now kind of post COVID with everyone having a lot less time, we really have to kind of prioritize on which project we want to do first which one's going to have the most impact um and I, it pains me to like put stuff on the back burner but you have to kind of make these decisions um and often it kind of feels like you know in those instances we might be letting people down or being too slow or too slow to um kind of complete the project or or reply to people but i think it kind of comes naturally and you just have to um, accept these kinds of things because you can't do everything at once and you can keep those ideas um, you know for the future when the team or the organization grows um, in the future um, and I think another thing that kind of links to the funding um, is I have a scientific background most of our volunteers have a scientific background um, none of us really have any business skills um, which I think is kind of like a nice um, thing to mention because I think a lot of people um, think that you have to have studied business or have you know uh, family that are in business or even know anything about what you're doing uh, to, to start something to start an initiative um, but I don't necessarily think that's the case it is definitely harder um, but you know you can just figure things out as you go you can ask questions find a mentor um, there's loads of stuff online you also I think don't necessarily have to start a business or an organization straight away you can do a project or an initiative and then see how that goes and if you want to then set up a company or an organization you can, you can do that later down the line um, and something I've definitely learned is as, as much as you can learn of these things and pick up skills, um, it's always good to know when to ask a professional to help you. Uh, for example, doing company accounts. Um, I wouldn't recommend doing those unless you are a trained accountant. Um, <laughs> uh, and I think this really kind of links to another one of the biggest challenges that we have, which is kind of what Jason was saying, and it's this kind of lack of funding. Um, we were lucky in that, everything that we do or have done so far um apart from the last couple of years was all kind of largely online so we didn't really need any funding to to start kind of communicating and educating um you know we do have kind of expenses but we're all a voluntary team um and we really started with just a, a website and a social media channel and then it's kind of grown from there so i think you can really you can have these big ideas but you can start small um and you know i always want to i kind of think of these ideas and i'm like oh I, yeah we can do this and then i make it bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and then i'm like actually maybe let's just like simplify that and start small and you know we can expand on it or make it bigger kind of year on year rather than trying to do everything and make it completely 100 percent perfect um from the offset um but i think yeah there's this also this chicken and egg situation for us where we've done 
a lot of projects and a lot of initiatives completely on a volunteer basis um, where you know organizations have contributed um, individuals have contributed our team has obviously contributed um, and we do have a number of kind of uh, financial sponsors which we're really grateful to but we're kind of in this phase now where we keep starting new things when actually we should be kind of having the idea finding the funding for that idea and then doing the idea um but because we're all so passionate and we want to do stuff and there's this urgency of needing to tackle the climate crisis tackle these issues that are affecting the ocean it's it's really hard to kind of scale back and say oh no wait we need to wait and we need to wait until we have money to do that because we we kind of know that we can do it without the funding but ideally you know to be able to actually properly scale up and to increase our impact we need to have funding to be able to pay people to work for us um or even to pay for things that would just like automate our processes or all of these kinds of things that just like really streamline an organization um we kind of need those things first so yeah we're kind of in this shifting phase at the moment of um trying to press the brakes a little bit which is um I think something that we don't always necessarily do, especially when you're in this kind of entrepreneurial um, field. Beautiful, beautifully said. Thank you so much. I think you you throwing so many important things that these uh, people who are watching this session should take note of, from you know from not having enough time to the funding to asking for professionals for the help. And another one important thing is knowing when to stop knowing when to stop, put the brakes like you just mentioned and take a step forward to do the current thing that you're doing in a better way, in a nicer way, so that you can move on to the next project that you really want to. Just beautiful, amazing. So uh, let's move on to the next person, Mayhwan. Yeah, so um, I think I'm gonna start with talking about the funding aspect, because um, I think Jason and Rebecca also brought that part up. So none of my projects would be successful without the support of a lot of people in my community. So for CYS, we work with a lot of corporate sponsors. Um, today we're doing an event with CPA Ontario. Um, and then we also partner with different corporations like Well Simple. Um, so it's a lot of these big companies who um, take the time and effort to really invest in youth. And I really appreciate that. And I think that's how um, you really empower young people in the community to take action is when you actually show them like your ideas are practical because you have a support system and you have um, people who believe in you and um, just giving you like practical opportunities is something that I think is really important. Um, so yeah, CYS, we really thrive on our community and corporate sponsors and partners. Um, as I touched upon briefly, I think in the intro, we also partner with a lot of like influencers and like in this day and age, I think the most influential people are people who know how to utilize a successful social media platform. So we've been able to host and like events and also interviews with um, other young people who are just absolutely killing it on like YouTube and TikTok and Instagram. And they have huge platforms that with like millions of followers and they advocate for like financial literacy and entrepreneurship and personal finance. And um, they just expand our like target demographics so much more. And by working with them, I think that's how we bring like our vision to life. Um, on the topic of Coast, I also um, received a lot of like funding and support from different scholarships and um, organizations. So my first, I think the first time that I ever like pitched my project was to um, a organization in Canada called um, SCWIST, which is um, I think the Society for Canadian Women in STEM and Technology. And they provided me with my first um, funding to turn my like prototype, which I think I like emailed like these like hand drawn photos too, um, but they gave me the funding to turn it into like a basic prototype, and from there I was able to um, enter again a lot of competitions like Jason pointed out. Um, I attended this competition called I Can, 
and I was able to win um, four awards from there and really um, get my project on like national news outlets, which really helped spread awareness and everything. And of course, um, a lot of the scholarships and competitions helped with the funding to really bring my vision to life and take the project to the next step. And because of that, I'm now able to um, successfully like pitch and also like produce a better product. And I think without these opportunities as a high school student, like where are you going to get like thousands of dollars from, right? It's kind of unrealistic if you don't have that community aspect to your work. Um, so I think that's really crucial to talk about. Like the moving force behind all of my projects really is the people that we work with and the other organizations that get involved. Awesome. Awesome. So it's, it's not really one person that uh, actually moved this. It's, it's an entire community and each stakeholders come in and give different kind of support resources and the guidance. And that's what makes the projects to move. That's what makes you guys to grow to the next level as well. That is really nice. And I can see the comments going, wow. So <laughs> I think you guys, the three of you guys really blow their mind. And uh, we only have six more minutes. I never seen how fast this time just fly by. And uh, there is an interesting question in the chat box that I would just like to ask. I think Rebecca, in a way that I've answered that question, but I'm just going to rephrase that question and ask you guys. So this person asked, like, how do you keep your passion alive? Um, about like, you know, how do you keep your passion alive? Because you guys have started this quite some time back. And how you guys are keeping your passion alive, even though there are other more interesting issues that is i wouldn't say interesting or like serious issues that is a while like you know over there that you guys keep your attention to so how do you guys keep your attention to this particular project that you started keeping your passion alive and uh, not looking at other things or even working on it in the free time that you can so who want to go first i think i think for me like I, I get asked this a lot um or like how to stay kind of positive in the face of you know climate crisis and biodiversity crisis and, and things like that um and i honestly think it's the people so the people like on our team the organizations that we meet and the individuals that are like doing so much amazing work so one of the things that we try and do at the marine diaries is really be a platform for those people that are doing um you know restoration or they're doing ocean education or you know they're kind of professionalizing um young people to to enter the industry or whatever they might be doing in all of these different areas they're all kind of moving towards that same goal of ocean protection ocean restoration and you know ocean conservation in general um and i think when i first started the marine diaries it felt kind of a bit lonely I guess like when I was growing up no one was very environmentally aware or like very passionate about the environment and um, I think well partly because over the last couple of years this has really really changed and the general awareness in like globally has has shifted um but I think also through running the marine diaries and like doing these collaborative projects with with different organizations and people it just really gives you hope that you know people are they do care they're trying to make a difference um and that you know kind of that we will get there um and i think you just have to kind of stay positive um and stay hopeful that you know we will kind of tackle these issues um but for me the ocean has always been like the the, the obsession i guess um so it's not super easy to get distracted by other things i mean ocean covers what 70 percent of our planet um there's just so much amazing wildlife that i still haven't seen that i want to see so um yeah for me it's it's not really that uh that hard to get distracted but <laughs> awesome thank you so much listen we oh, have three more minutes quick one quick yeah um, yeah, I, I think the points that Rebecca made were excellent. I mean, um, the analogy that I always use in my head is uh, entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. There's very high highs and very, very low lows, right? And so whenever I'm at the low points, I try to think about, okay, this is the price that I pay in order to be successful later. 
and just trying to continue to have that faith that it will work out, uh, it will get better, uh, and then you'll have a different challenge, right? And and what you hope for is just to have better problems. So whenever we have a problem that's, for example, related to, oh, we have a customer, but how do we help them? It's like, that's a good problem to have, right? And so when when you just stick through it for the first couple of times and you've been through those cycles enough times, you're like, okay, you know, the better times are coming soon. <laughs> and so that that's kind of where I try to keep my mind. And I certainly have distracted myself, but I will say when you do uh, multiple projects and get involved with multiple things, there's a lot of surprising ways that they can be complementary to each other. So a lot of wastewater technology is powered by solar energy. And so actually can marry those two opportunities in some interesting ways. So um, it's okay to be involved with different things uh, as long as you don't let any of those things suffer. And like Rebecca said, once you have a team, that's what makes it really easy to stick to because those people are what make an organization really special and what get you out of the, you know, out of the bed in the morning uh, to, to just keep going because they, they make it fun. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. So that's bring me to my last question, but you guys have to answer it very quickly, very nicely. One sentence. Okay. If, you want to leave this audience with one thing, like one sentence advice or whatever it is that you want to say to them. Like they, if they just keep repeating that, they will become a better person in their life or they will find the right people, resources, whatever that they need to move on in their goals. What will it be? Mehwan, you want to start first? Yeah, I think my thing would just be believe in yourself. Um, even when you don't have the resources or if other people don't believe in you, you have to believe in yourself and believe in your vision. Rebecca? Um, yeah, I would basically say the advice is to um, also develop your personal brand and don't forget about that, um, as well as your initiative, because that can really skyrocket um, your awareness and the opportunities that come to you. So focus on your, your strengths and your knowledge and don't hide behind your organization or your business. Awesome. Jason? The best piece of advice that I always got was that you've only truly failed if you haven't learned something. So it's always worth going out there, trying to make a difference, trying to be an entrepreneur, uh, even if you don't succeed because of those relationships you build that we talked about, uh, the fun and the memories that you create, and especially what you learn from the process that will help you in your next venture, even if you don't succeed in the first one. Awesome. Such a beautiful advice from the three, the three of you guys here. Thank you so much for uh, taking your time to be uh, in this panel and sharing your valuable experience. And I think this will definitely help all those youngsters who are watching the session right now, who are thinking, shall I, uh, you know, work on my passion project? Should I take action towards this? Shall I start my organization? Um, I think this is a great chance for them to actually start taking the action towards uh, their particular goal, their visions and stuff like that. And I think pretty much you guys covered everything uh, from taking steps towards your, you know, your ideas to finding the resources to how to develop it to the next level. You guys covered pretty much all the bases. So thank you so much, guys. Please do follow our speakers um, in their social medias, in their LinkedIn. If you guys have any further question or you want to get in touch with their organizations, because all three of them doing amazing uh, in running amazing organizations. And I think all of them takes voluntary basis. Like, you know, you can volunteer your time, even your, you know, just be there in their Zoom calls and whatever that they do will be a great way for you to learn from them as well. So please do get in touch with them and I will see you guys next time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you.